The Unshackled Waves, episode 233. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. As we go to air, the world has been rocked by yet another horrific terrorist attack in Sri Lanka, aimed at the nation's minority Christian community on Easter Sunday. The updated death toll is 310, with over 500 injured. 39 foreigners are among the dead, including two Australians. All of the evidence, as the unshackled broke first, points to the perpetrator being the Sri Lankan Islamic Jihadist group, the National Thauhith Jamath. This attack has once again highlighted the persecution and violence Christians face around the world by those acting in the name of Islam. In Australian politics, during the Easter holiday period, there was supposedly an election campaign truce from the major parties. Nevertheless, the issues of the campaign have still dominated the news cycle. Former Greens leader Bob Brown is leading the Adani convoy against the coal mine in central Queensland, starting from Hobart, and he wants to make the election a referendum on the mine. Bill Shorten is quite triggered over the coalition's campaign against the push for Labor to introduce inheritance taxes. He called it a lie and asked Facebook to investigate the spread of this so-called fake news. A bit rich from the man who campaigned on the Mediscare lie in 2016. And despite all of the negative publicity vegans have been receiving lately, due to their own conduct, it should be stressed, one more has just been elected to our parliament as the Animal Justice Party won the final seat in the New South Wales Upper House. To discuss all this, returning to the show is Unshackled team member Mark Martin Hartwig. Martin, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here, Tim. Now, as we're recording this, the world is still reeling uh, from another horrific uh, terrorist attack. Uh, in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday, there were eight coordinated uh, bombings that went off. Intelligence reports have revealed that an Islamic group, uh, the National Thauhid uh, Jamath, uh, were planning a, a terrorist attack, but it's clear, uh, based on the, the target and the fact that this is one of the holiest days on the Christian calendar, that it was an attack on Christianity. Yeah, absolutely shocking. Um, overnight, the death toll's gone up 100 um, from the figures that I'd heard last night. ABC, as far as I know, still hasn't reported on it. You know, people people say when, when things happen in non-Western countries that people don't notice. And I think there's something to be said by, you know, the Christchurch attack. There was all the Western media was present there. Um, and straight away, you know, everyone was condemning it. It was plastered across the news. Um, this is, you know, all white people need to take stock and uh, take responsibility for, for you know, the white supremacy that, that caused this attack. And, you know, I think everybody, everybody I know has condemned it and said it's, you know, it's barbaric. That's not what we want in Western countries. We want to be avoiding that. And as for Sri Lanka, you know, I know somebody who's uh, his his mum knew people who uh, uh, she's probably lost people in that in those attacks. So it kind of brings it home. Um, and it's just shocking that you know something like this can happen on Easter um, to to Christians worshiping at church, and those same people who are very quick to um, point the finger at everybody for the actions of one person now they're saying it's a complex issue you know we need to we need to step back and you know oh barack obama tweeted that it was an attack on easter worshippers he, he tweeted that twice and he didn't once say the c word yes hillary clinton she used the term uh, easter worshippers as well it's almost if a memo went out to progressive uh, politicians and uh, the that's a conspiracy that kind of thing doesn't happen and the Australian Greens, uh, they couldn't bring themselves to uh, mention the, the C word in those condolences. Uh, uh, Richard Di Natale, uh, Maureen Faruqi and Sarah Hanson Young all, all said that this was a terrible attack on uh, Sri Lankans. Uh, they couldn't mention that it was an attack on, on Christianity, even though it is the most persecuted religion 
in the world, they, they still can't bring themselves to say something sympathetic uh, towards that religion. Meanwhile, after the Christchurch massacre happened, uh, they were quick to blame uh, white supremacy, nationalism, uh, racism, uh, bigotry, uh, yet uh, uh, Jonathan Suri, a Greens councillor for the Gabba in Brisbane, said this is a complex issue, we shouldn't jump to conclusions or uh, exploit uh, this issue. That's exactly what you did after Christchurch. You said we need to have a crackdown on the the, the perpetrators, even if uh, you know white uh, people and nationalists aren't directly responsible. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that they're marginalised. Yeah, that's a play right out of Saul Alinsky's Rule for Radicals, isn't it? You know, make them live by their rules, but we don't have to live by them. It's just, I mean, and the Greens, the Greens, they don't care about Christian votes. They're, there's a few Christian, you know, well-meaning um, but naive, you know, Christian demographics who are going to vote for them because my refugees. Um, but for the most part, like Larissa Waters um, is another good one. You know, she, she hasn't said this, anything. She puts on a very kind face and, oh, I care so much. And on, on Easter Friday, she went to Holland Park Mosque and donned the the headdress uh. the color of the greens and there's all these other people i think green's quite a popular color with um the islamic faith um you know it's on the iranian flag and stuff so i mean it fits perfectly you know there's this they, they pander to these oppressed demographics um but you know the christians are the, part of the patriarchy part of the oppressive culture we can't possibly you know, offer them condolences or or give any ground because you know they're they're the oppressors. Yeah. So but if you look at global trends, um, you've got terror attacks happening daily against Christians. You know, in the lead up to the Notre Dame fire, you've got I think ten attacks on churches in France in the week before that. You know, you've got um, people trying to storm, you know, the pul the pulpit and you know, stab the priest in the middle of mass, you know, that doesn't really get media coverage. You've got uh, heaps of terror attacks from Boko Haram, and there's another spin-off in Nigeria. You've got, um, I think it's MILF in the Philippines, yeah. the, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, MILF. Okay. Pretty funny. Um, I have a black sense of humor, I suppose. Oh, yeah, but not really. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not funny. And these things, these things are happening globally on, an, like on a daily basis and they don't really get a mention because i guess people are desensitized to it and so when it happens in the west um you know we do get wall-to-wall -wall media coverage you know the media was reporting on that for a good three weeks every day multiple times through the day you know got the tv in the background and they and they've got some new big expose and they they milked it for all it was worth you know watch how quickly that this is going to be forgotten if it even gets reported on at all in the western media because it doesn't fit the agenda. Yeah, uh, you could even say that if if this because the the death toll is horrendous. I mean, two hundred and seven dead. I in a country of uh, twenty million. I, and that wasn't uh, that, just a lone wolf either. Yeah, I mean, it was coordinated it, bombings. I can't think of all the, the families affected and, you know, dare I say, do the, the left not care about, you know, brown victims of terrorism or ones that are not in the West? No, not if they're Christians. Mm. No. Yeah. yeah, like like I said, we, it hasn't been uh, confirmed yet. Uh, who? Well, no one's claimed uh, responsibility. Uh, you know when they sort of say, don't jump to conclusions, the investigation's ongoing, it's it's normally they're they're working towards say reaching a conclusion they don't like yeah and they if if it doesn't you know fit the agenda then they sweep it under the rug and just oh move on nothing to see here and, and australia does have a large connection with sri lanka there's a lot of uh sri lankan immigrants in australia who have uh integrated very well uh, into Australia. We used to have a Sri Lankan who worked on the Unshackled and uh, obviously Sri Lanka is a big cricketing country. We play them quite regularly. They have that British uh, colonial uh, legacy. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's definitely uh, fits 
hits quite close to home and uh, Sri Lanka it's also had a 26 year civil war from 1983 to uh, 2009 where well, that was the uh, Sinhalese uh, Buddhists um, fighting against the uh, Hindu Tamils so it's been a nation that's been ravaged by terrorism and war and we just thought that it was having a decade of peace but this has just blown it all away yeah um, one of my Sri Lankan mates um, you know his mum he was saying that his mum knows potentially knows victims or she doesn't know if they're safe or not and he, he was telling me that uh, I don't know how long ago it was but he was alleging that the Greens were actually fundraising for these separatist groups in Sri Lanka. Yeah. The money the was basically was basically going to suicide vests. You know, you've got these nice little church ladies. Oh, we need to help them. You can send them money. They'll spend it on first aid and medicine. And <laughs> they're off there spending it on, on suicide vests. It's just it's insane. Well let's go back to Australia and a, a group of Australians that have been on the march is uh, vegans. Now they burst onto the uh, the scene a couple of weeks ago um, with their National Day of Action with of course Melbourne being the epicentre where they blocked uh, traffic in the busy uh, Flinders and Swanson Street intersection in the in the CBD to draw attention to their uh, vegan propaganda documentary uh, Dominion. Now there was a strong backlash against them for inconveniencing them. Many people said I ate a steak dinner that night out of spite and they also uh, invaded a whole bunch of farms uh, yeah. to, to protest. They've been doing that for quite a while quite uh, aggressively and really distressing farmers. They've stolen some of their livestock. Yeah, it's, re it's, yeah, it's, it's really barbaric. Uh, <clears throat> It's really uh, horrific and barbaric s stuff they're doing, but vegan, it's not just a noisy minority. I mean, we just had another vegan elected to the nation's parliament, uh, Emma Hurst, who's a vegan was that on bodybuilder. A vegan, was that on a vegan platform, or was, well, did she just happen to be a vegan? Well, she was from the Animal Justice Party, and in my experience, most of the, the members are vegans. And right. so uh, she uh, she grabbed the the final New South Wales uh, Legislative Council uh, spot. Uh, she ironically enough uh, beat David Linehelm, who is a uh, sporting shooter, supports hunting and uh, trophy hunting. So many people thought there was irony in that. Um, Hurst said that animal uh, rights it's not a left right issue. And uh, it's also got one of the, the strongest minor party uh, memberships of uh, the Animal Justice Party. And there is, according to Roy Morgan Research, over 2 million self-described vegans in Australia. So it's not just they haven't just burst, uh, a few random ones have just burst onto the scene and causing trouble. They're, they're actually a large segment of Australia's population. And it's funny, um, you know, you've got this very vocal minority of, I guess you'd call them radical vegans. You know, if you've got two, two million of, who describe themselves as vegans, they're not out there blocking traffic. They're just quietly going about their lives. They've made an ethical health decision, um, you know, in their minds, that's, that it's the right thing. And in, in, the right, in their minds, it's the right thing for them. And they don't go around um, disrupting other people's livelihoods. Um, and you know, good on them if that's if that's how they want to live their life. And who who am I to to judge that? But um, I think the issue is, um, like we've seen, these people going onto properties. They're likely unvaccinated. There's a little thing called Q fever. Um, if you want to work in a meat works or on a dairy farm or whatever, you have to get vaccinated. And so the odds are these these people aren't vaccinated. They're putting livestock at risk. So they they're saying that you know they care about livestock, but you know, they're, they're perhaps well-meaning but misguided. And that's what I've said from the start, you know, from my first article that I wrote about James Warden um, when he was, I think we might touch on it later, but mm. it was the big thing that really pushed it into the public spotlight was um, West Australia vegan activist James Warden. He was going on to a uh, Harvey beef farm and he was filming this guy's livestock like a friggin' stalker. You know, um, and, and this farmer's come out and he's gone, you know, what are you doing here? You're not welcome. And he's like, it's, it's public land. I'm allowed to. And he's just like, well, can you please leave? And then it escalated from there. 
um, you know that that sort of put it into the, the the public consciousness, perhaps in the wrong way. I think there was there was a lot of disagreement among, from what I could see, the chatter in the activist communities. The people going, "This isn't how we want to get our message out there. We distance ourselves from him." You know, we believe in peaceful, lawful protest, um, and he's going on there committing trespass. Um, I, I might say possibly breaching um, biosecurity legislation, but that's not what they actually charged him on, you know. Um, I can't off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, he breached bail as well. <laughs> he, he refused, to, yeah. So, um, but when I wrote that, I did a bit of digging into the activist scene, just not like undercover or anything. I just looked on their Facebook pages um, on the Dominion movement and that kind of thing, Aussie Farms. And you can see that, like, I reported on it um, I predicted, based on my research, April 8th was going to be a big day. Um, they were saying they're going to have na nationwide protests. Um, and they kept it kind of hush-hush about what they were actually planning. Um, and then we saw an abattoir where they went inside, chained themselves, and then <laughs> basically took some livestock hostage. Like they said, oh, if you let us go and drop the charges, um, we'll give you back these livestock. <laughs> Like that's insanity. Um, yeah, it's extortion, that, really. Yeah, I mean, their 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 tactics that they, they use are very, uh, or, or, almost a terrorist uh, tactics. I mean, they I are. I I described it as economic terrorism. I, I think we don't want to dilute, you know, violent terrorism too much and overuse it. But yeah, it certainly is. It's economic terrorism um, because in their minds, the beef or the the livestock industry is cruel and unjust and it needs to end um you know if there's if there's viable alternatives to meat that they want to go and invent and they want to go work in a laboratory and, and then they want to eat it that's fine but you know we've got a large portion of the australian economy is dependent upon these primary producers in regional areas where you haven't got high skilled jobs readily available um you've got you know, school leavers who are going out and, and working in these places who are paying taxes to fund the lifestyle of these people who have the t somehow have the time to travel cross country and invade people's property. Um, I would hazard a guess that they're they're probably university students who are on the teat. So I think it's kind of rich um, that yeah they want to basically bite the hand that feeds them. Well, it doesn't feed them if they're vegan, but you know what I'm saying financially they want to cause damage to this industry. And now we've seen their drafting legislation to um, put mandatory on the spot fines. Um, you know, you've got it in the public consciousness. Well done. But yeah. Uh. Well, they say they care about the animals, but their invasions of these farms and the fact that they're just grabbing and running with these animals, I mean, that spooks them. I mean, uh, the, yeah. these animals would be in distress. And you mentioned the, the, the buyer uh, security uh, hazard. I mean, it's... The, it, these people are not very rational. Uh, they're they're, they're no. fundamentalists. They believe that anyone who uh, uses animals uh, for meat or, or dairy is an inherently bad person, and so anything they do is justified because they're in the right. It's the same kind of uh, thinking that, without comparing them to ISIS, it's the same kind of black and white thinking. It's um, it's referred to as um, there's there's a psychological disorder for it. Basically, it's there's no gray area. It's either you're vegan or you're the devil incarnate, and anything that happens to you that's bad, we're going to laugh about. In group, out group type thinking. Yeah, and it's not how it's not how you win people over. It's uh, like you can have conversations, respectful conversations with your friends and family about it. But if, if you're bringing it up at every family dinner and, and making a big so sh song and dance and, you know, stopping people from going to work and slashing tires and invading people's property. You know, I was speaking to a friend about who knows a lot of farmers um, in the Darling Downs area around Toowoomba. And, and he said, you know, they're on edge. You know, they've got people, random cars rocking up to their properties at 10 p.m. at night. Like what other purpose would they have, you know, s snooping around their property at that hour of night? Um and it's, they're, they're creating, now I've yet to verify this story, but he said somebody 
actually had a heart attack chasing these people around his paddock. Um, you know, so it's they're having an impact certainly, and their their desire is to make it difficult for these people who are often, like I've written about in my articles, they're more prone to suicide. Um, they're more uh, prone. They're more uh, vulnerable to fluctuations in uh, drought and flood, and their profit, their actual margins of success are pretty narrow. You know, I was um, I was in a, a store speaking with a, a lady the other day, and she was saying that one of her customers came in and he was really upset, and she said, you know, what's up? And he said, oh. You know, one of my good friends, uh, he tried to go sell his, his cattle at the market and they didn't sell. And so he brought them home, he shot them, and then he shot himself. Yeah. You know, this is the kind of thing that, that they don't see, is that it, there's a real, there's an animal cost, sure, but there's a human cost as well. Mm. I hope for all this talk uh, recently about care for our farmers, uh, our politicians, uh, both left and right, uh, make sure that our farmers are protected from uh, these aggressive uh, vegans. And it's good that there are going to be uh, new laws uh, introduced f for farm trespassers. And it was good that, well, even though it took Victoria Police three hours to remove vegan protesters in the Melbourne uh, CBD, that they are facing serious charges which carry a maximum penalty of uh, five years jail. Uh, Daniel Andrews, the Premier, has said he's not going to pursue uh, costs. And when pressed about it by a reporter, he agreed that, oh, they don't have much money. Yeah, well, um, you know, there has to be consequences for if you're going to cause financial damage to other people, there has to be some sort of consequences. I don't know about five years prison, but I guess that's the maximum, right? That's they're not just going to well, be they're going to keep doing out. it. They've yeah, uh, they're, they're they're these vegans have said like the, the their reason for doing this is oh nobody's listening to us, so we have to break the law, disrupt people to get our message across. My argument is well, if people aren't you know listening to you at the moment, then maybe that's because you're not making a compelling argument. Yeah, you know, there's. Consuming less meat is good for some people, but not for all people. Um, you know, some people, such as myself, I don't know, my my grandma says because I'm an O blood type or whatever that I have to eat a diet that's rich in red meat in order to, you know, have energy. Um, we were apex predators before we became domesticated. And, you know, that's how we got most of our nutrients was as hunter-gatherers. Um, so I think there is something to be said about the industrialization of the food chain, um, sort of removing us from that natural um, sort of acquisition of nutrients. You know, we used to actually have to work for it, right? We'd have to physically go out and, and hunt the damn thing and skin it and, and whatever. And now we just go and we pick it up in a package and you've got people who don't even know, they, they just think that it comes from the meat store. <laughs> you know, they don't. So I think there's a lot of education that, that needs to be done about, um, you know, the food chain and, and how it how it comes about um and i think sure if there's breaches of animal welfare that they should be investigated you know just because i eat meat and i eat a lot of meat like i like meat i love it yeah. um but i it doesn't mean that i hate animals you know i'm staying in a place right now and we've got bloody five dogs <laughs> a ridiculous amount of animals and i love them um but there's yeah it's um there's this this argument that's made that people who eat meat, they don't they don't like animals, um, and that's just not true. You talk to a farmer, and 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 they ha they're the ones that actually have to put put animals down. You know, they see the reality of it, and if they're not killed in a humane, controlled way, then nature's a lot more nasty. I was watching a video by a farmer, and he was talking about what actually happens in nature if a cow dies or goes down it takes days for them to die mm. you know and then and then they're getting attacked by flies that'll it's there's nasty details that i won't go into and then the dingoes come and it can take days for them to die under that you know in natural circumstances and that's why it was in my opinion, disappointing that this these latest vegan uh, incidents seem to be rewarded with the the burger chain are grilled, introducing meat free Mondays to to cater for a growing uh, vegan population, and said that they want by twenty twenty fifty percent of its uh, menu to be plant based. 
it's their own private business, you know, if, if that's a gamble that they're willing to take, they've yeah, I'm obviously not done their grilled. market research. I think Grilled's overrated, to be honest. Like, it, the, the novelty was there at, at first, you know, oh, wow, burgers. But now I just find them to be overpriced and a little bit disappointing. Yeah. Oh, well, there is uh, that uh, vegan fast food uh, place, Lord of the Fries. I mean, that does a, a roaring trade. It's, it's There's a few in the Melbourne... Um, CBD. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm a, a capitalist. Yeah. So, uh, if if somebody wants to set up a, a vegan business, but I sort of don't like the idea that the next stage of corporate virtue signaling is catering to to vegans. I mean, that's their personal decision, really. If that's a business decision that they want to make, um, hmm. it, does it Qantas is offer of... vegan meals? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's kind of icky, like, it's kind of transparent, like, you can see they're, they're trying to be like, oh, you know, look at us, we're responsible corporate citizens and all of that. Um, but I will, I will make the point that there's no such thing as cruelty-free food, full stop. It just doesn't exist. Um, even if you're growing food in your own backyard, um, I mean, there's food with less cruelty, certainly, um, but... You can't feed the, po the global population at its current level without some level of cruelty. That's um, perhaps the world population should be reduced um, so we can live more sustainably. Oh, well, you know where they don't serve uh, vegan food, which is in prison. You mentioned <laughs> uh, James Warden. He's been held on uh, remand for, for breaching uh, bail. He's he stole a piglet in Western Australia. He's been all over the place. He um, uh, was also wanted over an offence in New South Wales. He didn't eat in in jail because they didn't have uh, vegan food. And I, I'm surprised there's anything left of him. There's he, really nothing there to for him to lose. I, I'm wondering whether this is going if they're going to be viewing him as a political prisoner being tortured. He's <laughs> He, he, he's being uh, uh, denied uh, his uh, personal life choice while, while in prison. This is uh, an outrage. Like, are they going to hold a vigil outside the prison? People, people in prisons have kind of surrendered by breaking the law. They've surrendered some of their rights inherently. Um, that's the whole, the whole point of prison is to be part rehabilitation, part punishment. Um, but I think it's that people who have dietary requirements i mean veganism isn't a religion perhaps if they were a religion um they they might get some form of protections you know you've got um some some groups like for example if a jewish person were to go to jail or a seventh day adventist they wouldn't want to be eating pork products or um you know crab or or whatever so i think yeah, i don't know it's it's a difficult one well, there the Earth lovers have been very active uh, recently, especially uh, as there's a federal election uh, happening. Uh, they're busy opposing the Adani uh, Carmichael coal mine in uh, central Queensland, which is going to export coal to um, energy-hungry India. Uh, now, the, the federal government uh, ticked off their approvals just before the election uh, was called. Uh, there's still uh, two uh, state government approvals to go, and the, the Queensland Palaszczuk government looks like it's not going to make a decision until after the election, which is concerning. And Bill Shorten, he is uh, trying to weasel his way out of a policy position, saying oh, if it stacks up environmentally, uh, we'll support it. If he's in central Queensland or north Queensland trying to win a seat up there, he'll say something there. But down in, in a Melbourne or Sydney, which I don't get why people in living in the cities would care about a mine uh, over 100 kilometres away from them, uh, but apparently they do. So he's sort of using weasel words, which I find really uh, disingenuous, but it's what, it's what we've come to expect from Bill Shorten. He won't give a straight answer, even if he's asked uh, by a journalist. Yeah, there was that video of the Channel 10 journalist basically saying, well, you didn't answer the question. And he, he did a very uh, sloppy job of avoiding it. It made for some good, uh, you know, even 
people who don't really follow politics that's that's what they know about the labor campaign now is that yeah. you know he's and 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 i think the greens took their their the energy policy off their website as well so it's like there's these the major three parties are kind of relying upon people to vote habitually like they've always voted without knowing what their actual policies are they're just kind of hoping to cruise through the election bold play let's see how it works out um i think we're going to see a swing to a lot of minor parties uh, a former greens leader bob brown he's leading the the adani convoy which is traveling from hobart to uh, central queensland then back to canberra for a final rally and the first thing i th uh, thought when i heard about this convoy uh that that's going to be uh, a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions with all those motor vehicles but apparently it contains uh, electric cars so they are being uh, environmentally friendly but uh, and where I does thought... the electricity come from that powers those vehicles you're you know, thinking what... too much <laughs> what do they do with the batteries when when the car reaches the end of its life cycle <laughs> mm. how do they recycle those batteries yeah. um they don't really think about that and yeah are they planting seventy thousand trees on their way up there um and what about you know because this is a trip that they don't have to make it's not like it's commuting to work or or, or driving to the hospital you've got a hundred vehicles um 500 people all packed in these vehicles they're going to be using um products along the way they're going to be probably leaving mess um in the town where the main adani mine is going to be they've i saw an article where they were saying we're not going to serve them they're not going to get a latte in this town you know because it's going to create 500 jobs for a very small area which relies upon these these uh these, yeah. these sites and these contracts and they local There's, businesses in yeah it was the town of claremont they're refusing um yeah re refusing service in in bars to uh opponents of the the adani coal mine who uh, are fly-ins and that's what annoys me most about I think as be i said before spot. yeah <laughs> like the, the the fact that you know you live nowhere near the mine uh you're you're coming in to to say to these locals no you're not allowed to improve your standard of living because we know better and and we say so i mean uh, yeah. i i i think it, they're well within nice their to right be... to tell yeah. them to fuck off <laughs> yeah i mean it'd be nice to be so removed from reality to uh to be able to make that your number one priority like how privileged do you have to be to for climate change and renewable energy to be your number one sort of policy uh concern and i saw a graph of um nationwide uh people surveyed and asked about you know what is your number one concern and most of regional and rural australia it was cost of living and um employment stability like being employed enough and all the areas um there was eastern sydney inner city melbourne inner city brisbane the inner city areas where you know these these white collar people um who have quite a, a large climate impact for living in these areas uh, their number one concern is is you know climate change <laughs> and it's um i just think it says a lot about our society and also uh, these you know inner city white people i should say they're uh, denying electricity to poor brown people in india like it's okay for these people to enjoy the benefits of electricity with their their iphones and other uh, gadgets but apparently because we're in a climate emergency uh, it's not okay for for brown people to have access to to, to basic uh, power we, uh, and well the, which the is left... required which is yeah. required in their economy to lift them out of poverty or they would prefer that they they, uh, they sort of view any type of brown person as the noble savage i mean they live closer to nature let's keep them that way so if you're yep. if you're born in in india in poverty uh you should be kept there and not have access to the advanced features of our civilization which i just find absolutely disgusting yeah it's the uh the trend of the self-loathing inner city bug man who knows how far removed from reality he or she is um 
but they're, they're hooked on the technology, man, and they're, and they're getting closer and closer to transcendence, and they can't unplug from the Matrix now. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, it's very difficult to go back to a low-tech um, way of living when you've become accustomed to um, all of the conveniences you know being close to hospitals like when i was younger i i wanted to go and do the whole into the wild um you, you're familiar with the movie in the book you know he was just like ah oh, screw society i'm gonna go see the world and um live in nature and and read books and live my best life and he ended up dying of starvation in the alaskan wilderness somewhere mm. so there's reality there's this your dream of of wanting to to live that life but Again, it's been removed from the harsh realities of shorter lifespans. Um, you know, before all these modern conveniences, the main cause of death was like tooth decay. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know basic dentistry um, that we take for granted. So I think there's a lot of people that need reality checks. I think it comes back to our education system. And I know we were quite uh, critical of the vegans in the previous segment, but at least they practice what they preach. Uh, not only do they not consume uh, meat and dairy, but they, they don't use uh, any animal products. I mean, they actually make sure that, you know, they... Apparently, yeah. it's difficult to do. I tried yeah. when I was younger, when I was idealistic. You know, I listened to a bit of uh, The Smiths, Meat is Murder. Mm. Oh, oh, the animals! Oh, but they no, make the I effort. Yeah, well, it's very difficult to try and find decent clothing that doesn't have leather in it. You know, um, you know, you got to change your belt, you got to change your shoes. But then the nylon from those shoes probably has a pretty big environmental impact too. Um, then you've got the issue of uh, malnourishment, which is you know part of the reason why these vegans are so rabid and irrational. It's because the brain requires vitamin B seventeen. Oh, B12, B17, I don't know. Um, anyway, the point is there's things in meat that our brains required because we evolved to, you know, to become dependent on that. That's what enables us to have higher cognitive ability and made us, you know, rise to the top of the food chain. It's, it's diff it's, I've tried it. It's difficult to live a vegan lifestyle. I think there's a certain amount of privilege required to live the vegan lifestyle. You've got to have access to you know, be able to grow vegetables or, or have this constant supply of trucked in uh, fruit and vegetables, which also has an environmental impact. It comes back to no such thing as cruelty free food, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going back to, um, yeah, the opponents of the Adani coal mine. It's like there is no, hardly any effort to make to cut back electricity. Or, well, they think that just sticking solar panels on your roof will will, will solve it. But there, there's no dedicated campaign to sort of live off the grid, to use the expression. Well, maybe they should walk. That, that'd be a bit more in tune with what they're trying to live by. Well, they would. You know? they catch public transport, but how do the, the trains and buses, how do they function? I think they just come from the, the train and bus factory, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a while ago, there was an Adani protest in Brisbane, or it was the Gold Coast. Either way, there was a big group of these anti-Adani people catching the train. And it's quite ironic, that, yeah. Now, campaigning's kind of taken a break uh, during the, the Easter holiday uh, period, uh, but the, the leaders have still made public appearances when they've been going to uh, church uh, services and there's still been uh, government ministers and backbenchers appearing on breakfast TV to uh, debate the issues of the the campaign but um, uh, Bill Shorten he's been quite uh, triggered uh, by a advertising campaign by a number of conservative groups alleging that Labor is going to introduce a 40% a death tax uh, when they get into government. Now, Scott Morrison said there's a secret deal with the Greens. This uh, inheritance tax, death, death tax, or as people are now calling it, a death bill, it was previously espoused by Andrew Lee, who's the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, the ACTU, the 
left-wing think tank, the Australia Institute and the uh, Greens, except they've gone quiet uh, on inheritance tax uh, since uh, Julian Burnside is trying to win over rich retirees in the inner Melbourne seat of Kooyong. Uh, mm. So uh, Bill Shorten's called it a lie. Uh, he's asked uh, Facebook to investigate uh, the spread of this uh, fake news. Uh, supposedly Facebook's got to crack down on this. And But I just see this as the, the revenge of the, the Mediscare campaign and good on the Liberal rules for giving the uh, labor a taste of their own medicine yeah i think it's uh i haven't really looked that much into it i've done a sort of cursory bit of reading um i don't know whether or not like the the labor campaign has been quite dishonest and disingenuous from what i can gather that i think they should just from the start put their policies out there uh, but they do what's sort of like the approach is uh, a trickle of information every day they want to release a little bit of information that's in their favor um, and it's, it's kind of, it, it is disingenuous and it's disrespectful to the voters, frankly. Now, as for death tax, I'm not completely opposed to the idea. I wouldn't like, I don't think taxes are inherently bad. I think people are disenfranchised and a little bit peeved at what those taxes are then used for. You know, if it was for infrastructure and schools and hospitals and training facilities to train the next generation of Australians to actually have gainful employment, then yeah, I, you know, taxes are okay if they're used responsibly. But we've got um, politicians constantly voting their wages up every year without fail. In 2012, they voted twice to increase their wages. Um, and they're, they're very happy to give our money to the United Nations. They're very happy to, uh, to give our money for, to not-for-profits. Not I think there was a thing with uh, Julie Bishop uh, was was talking to Rihanna on Twitter, some Save oh, the yes. Children fund. Yeah, I think you were writing about that. Yeah, run by Julie Gillard. Yeah, and so, you know, they're very happy to throw around other people's money. But all taxes, there's no such thing as government money. It's our money that's been entrusted to the government. And I think we should have a say in how that money is spent. And it should be spent responsibly. And so I think it's, you know, a lot of the people who are going to be hit the hardest by this death tax, I mean, it's not them that's going to be hit hard, hardest by it because they're going to be dead, right? They, but their children, they're like, you work hard to build a legacy for yourself, to leave something to your children, so hopefully they can be better off than you were, right? That's, that's what most people, I think, who believe in family and tradition, that's what they want, right? You slave your guts out in a field, you work as a child, you, you, you work overtime so you can build something. Yeah. Then like, you get taxed at 50% once you get above that tax bracket, right? Um, and I think there's this misconception that people who are in these higher tax brackets have just been handed it all. You know, sure, there's some people who have, who have inherited wealth, um, but they get taxed on it constantly. You know, one of my mates, he's, he's a sparky. He works on a Sunday. That's, that should be your bread and butter, right? He gets taxed at 50%. Mm. Yeah, Just, we have yeah, so. we have enough taxes already, and uh, if there's if there's one thing that the Australian public can't stand, it's another uh, tax uh, slog. Which uh, Labor they're going to this election promising uh, new taxes to wind back uh, negative gearing, uh, to end uh, franking uh, credits, and uh, I'm not completely against. To be honest, like yeah. I think those are good policies. Oh, well, I, I certainly want to see less tax uh, across the board because I, I just think, well, especially Labor, um, they know how to, to waste money and they know how to give it to uh, their uh, mates in the in the public service and other uh, largest organisations. And yeah, the the Canberra Liberals they they got into trouble uh, for this uh, campaign slogan, uh, rent tax, car tax, talking about uh, Labor's proposed uh, electric car target home tax, uh, retirement tax, uh, uh, Bill Shorten and Labor will tax you to death. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that we haven't really seen much wage growth in Australia in terms of in line with the cost of living increases. Um, if real, Bill Shorten, he can't, he, can't, uh, ha he, has, he can't wave a magic wand and make everyone's wages uh, go up. No. No. Um, no, he can't. <laughs> but, you know, they can certainly 
try and, and use uh, um, taxpayer money to pay off the people who are going to vote for them. You know, now we've seen a shift away from uh, sort of this labor union working class uh, approach and now it's they're trying it's like they're trying to grab the greens the people who are going to vote for the greens they want them to vote for them it's this race for the middle as they say um, but it, I think it's sort of a, a race to the left now and another ad that um, the the liberals put out was the uh, the tax bill merry go round where uh, Bill Shorten he um, I think it was at the Easter show went on a merry go round and the time it <laughs> comes that. around they 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 put they put an extra tax there and yeah it's like the Liberals the reason why they nearly lost in 2016 is because uh, they had this really uh, soft uh, limp campaign which allowed uh, Labor to have their Medicare campaign where they said Medicare was going to be privatized which what does that even mean but the implication was that the liberals were going to end public health care as we know it which was just a blatant lie and i remember the the liberal campaign director at the time tony nutt after the election he cried at the national press club saying labor scared my m elderly mother i mean you're you're supposed to be the hard man putting out the aggressive attack ads and you're crying over your opponent's ad what a soft cock yeah um the liberals are pretty uninspiring to be honest like now now we've seen a, a shift in the liberal party towards away from conservatism and the increasingly left uh, empowered left-wing faction of the liberal party which you know, they still have they're still overwhelmingly white and male sure um but they'll do whatever it takes to hold on to their seats and if that means you know condemning people who are more hardline than they are to try and in their minds win a few votes which they're not going to win like you're not going I don't know how many times we have to say this but you're not going to win over these far left people okay they they it's like Cory Bernardi um speaking out against Fraser Anning or um what was it Lyle Shelton Australian Christian lobby like I've seen the insane amount of hatred that they have for that man and it's like he's trying to win himself points with these people by condemning Fraser Anning. It's not going to work, mate. They they hate the values that you allegedly stand for. So there's there's no point trying to appease these people. Yeah, yeah and but I definitely think it's changed during the election and the Liberals under Scott Morrison and the new Liberal campaign director. Um, Andrew Hurst, uh, they're being a lot more aggressive, a lot more nasty in their messaging, saying if you vote for Labor, you're going to get big government who's going to take your money. There, there is this differentiation, which, well, which gives voters some semblance of of choice and a, a reason to to vote for the right. I agree that yeah, the the liberal left faction they've uh, been busy uh, ca capturing the the policy. And direction of the the Liberal Party, but uh, definitely, I think this campaign is a lot more impressive and dif differentiated itself from Labor than uh, three years ago under Turnbull. Well, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't really follow mainstream Australian politics that much because it's, it's pretty pretty drab, so it's not my specialty area. So. But I, I look forward to the election um, and the election coverage. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll have some uh, some interesting developments. You know, people saying that oh, Fraser Anning only got 19 votes. Well, you know, he's he's got more Facebook likes than Richard Di Natale, <laughs> the leader of the Greens Party. So Sorry, we'll see how that pans out. Green opponent in the election, uh, Larissa Waters. Yeah, she's been doing a she's been busying herself with. Uh, giving him extra publicity, you know, giving him the finger multiple mm. times. Um, you know, put Fraser Anning in the bin where he belongs. Well, you're just giving him extra publicity, aren't you? And people who hate the Greens are going to vote for him now because they know that he's the antithesis to you. Now, last time I had you on the show, uh, you were um, 
beginning your recovery after being assaulted by Brisbane Antifa out at um, Musgrave Park outside the Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux Brisbane uh, show. Now, obviously you're in much better health now. I mean, people, our video viewers can, can see you. You've made a full uh, recovery, but uh, how um, intensive was that uh, recovery process? Uh, the first three months were were pretty rough. Um, there was a lot of things I couldn't do for myself. Um, so, yeah, good on you guys. You you did a bang up job. Um, and for a while there, it was it was difficult to get back into employment. But as soon as I got my medical clearance, I started on call casual work. I worked my guts out in a factory. You know, well they're up. Um, holding up the same sign, give Nazis butterflies, holding up that sign in far north Queensland, patrolling the beach for fascists with their staunch comrades. I was hard at work getting back on my feet, um, paying taxes. I, I got off Centrelink as soon as I could. I was, I was rushing out that door. So, um, you know, I, I, I did what I had to do. I got that experience in a factory. Um, I was even, yeah, I was traveling a lot for that and um, that's helped to rehabilitate me quite quickly. And now I'm working in a full-time job where I'm doing overtime. So manual, manual labor, you know, so. Yeah, uh, that, that, I'm glad that uh, you've been able to um, make a, a good recovery and yeah, you're doing well for yourself now. I'd, all, I'd like to add to that, that, uh, um, you know, they say success is the best revenge, but um it's also good to see that I did a little bit of personal investigating. You see, I found um, the alleged leader of Brisbane Antifa, Kathleen McLeod. Hi, Kathleen, if you're watching this. Hope you're doing well. I hear you're unemployed recently. Previously worked as an administrative assistant at the University of Queensland. Um, I did a little bit of sniffing around and they said, mm, she doesn't work here anymore. So, um, yeah, feels pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm slogging my guts out earning myself some decent money, best money I've ever earned in my life. And, it, um, you know, she's posting memes about it's national steal from work day. You know, if, if you have that kind of attitude towards employment and employers, it's little wonder why you're unemployable. Yeah. If you so. want to have a bit of a, a laugh, uh, visit the, uh, the Brisbane anti-fascist action page uh, when it's not, uh, banned, uh, there's some quite unhinged, uh, <laughs> a post there from uh, Kathleen. Uh, uh, she, she, she's, ha she's had a go at me for having uh, Vaseline uh, <laughs> lips. Uh, so that, that gives you a bit of an indication of her sort of uh, intelligence and sort of uh, uh, pl uh, p political uh, strategy that <laughs> where, where she goes on the attack. Yeah, it's 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 been interesting to watch. It's like watching somebody slowly lose their minds, or quite rapidly descend. You know, I I want to be above like wishing the worst on people, but frankly, if you're going around assaulting people who you disagree with politically, you you kind of deserve to be miserable. I'll say that I'm not going to incite violence at all, but you deserve to be miserable until you learn to be a decent person. Uh, yeah. Now there was a police investigation opened up into your assault, but mm -hmm. that hasn't led to any arrests. No, um, it's quite interesting. Even though you so captured the whole thing on captured on camera. the whole thing on GoPro. Yep. Um, in Queensland, there's no law against covering your face in a public place. Wow. Um, yep, I've learned that, and. Uh, the, the last time I spoke to an officer about it, he said, you know, oh, their clothing was quite non, non, nondescript. You know, if you went into my closet, you'd probably find a black hoodie um, or anybody's closet. You'd probably find, you know, black clothes. I'm thinking, who wears black clothes anymore? Like, come on, get some fashion sense. Put a bit of color on. It's 2019, people. Um, so most, most people don't have that kind of – that's like – you know, black pants, black hoodie. Most people don't have that in there. I mean, I say this, you're wearing a black jacket right now, but it's not a hoodie. Anyway, so I was basically told, look, you know, mate, um, there's not, not enough evidence to, to try and push on it. And, you know, all those 
those names that I got through, I think I've already gone into how I, you know, came across some of the names, um, you know, that, that deleted their Facebook profile 15 minutes after bumping into me in the emergency room. That's just circumstantial, you know. And the fact that uh, police negotiators were speaking with them before they came down to the convention center, which I caught on video. I've got that on live video. The officer came up to me and he said, what are you doing, mate? And I said, I'm recording. He said, I'm going to ask you to please move on because um, they were trying to build rapport with the protesters. And it's, yeah. it's kind of, it. if you see someone in public wearing a face mask in a group, right, all wearing black with signs that literally incite violence, wouldn't you think that it would be um, responsible to at least get a few IDs? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty disappointing, frankly, but um, at the same time, I'm not surprised. You know, these people, they, they go around and they, they say they hate cops, cops are fascists, FTP, ACAB, all cops are bastards, they say. Um, and I, you know, I said that to him and he's like, well, they're welcome to their opinion. It's kind of it's kind of difficult to to not see them as a, an effective arm of uh, political suppression. Even though so, Antifa would like to smash them if they could. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and what's interesting, we mentioned Jonathan Suri earlier. Now this assault happened in the Gabba Ward, which is Green's um, councillor Jonathan Suri's area. So um, I'm not making any allegations, but it's I think it's quite interesting that. These people who uh, allegedly assaulted me um, would be very likely to be Greens um, on the ground, the people that are helping them campaign, essentially, um, you know, their boots on the ground. And so uh, I, after shortly after my assault, when I still had my hand in a, in a splint or whatever, um, I happened to be in the city when the the Greens were having a little pro-refugee rally um, at the same time that there was a second um, South Africa rally a few blocks away. And I think we can probably show some clips from it in the video later. Um, but I confronted her. I'm like, you know, this is what's happened. Uh, do you condemn the people who did this? And she sort of weaseled around the issue and sort of went, well, if you're a Nazi, I probably don't back you. Yeah. yeah. And, and they... <laughs> Made no like no direct condemnation, right? It was and that's quite that's revealing. Real... Yeah, and now if you look in the video, you can see I've documented. Um, it was quite serendipitous that I managed to you know get all of the stalls that were there, and you can see this kind of incestuous um, far left activist community. Um, you've got Greens, you've got Larissa Waters, you've got um jonathan sari has got a little pavilion there you've also got the anti-poverty network and unite at the same stall now the anti-poverty network is a front group for unite which you can google it um it's a trotskyist i believe far left organization that's been around since the 70s um uh, lucas roses has, has written a fair bit about them now, they're also, um, there's also Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance, all at this nice big happy clappy parade. And there's Jonathan Sri leading the parade. Um, and one of the people who stood up for, he, he kind of took issue, he's, oh, hang on a second, I, I take issue with, you know, you saying that uh, Antifa is essentially violent. <laughs> he's a, you know, I'm, I'm standing here with my hand in a friggin' cast like, hey man, I don't know. I I don't know why, but I have a different opinion about that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's different non-violent forms of anti-fascism, sure, but um, well, it's he's completely he's he's completely dodged the whole issue and going. Well, hang on a second. You can't say they're all violent. Yeah. You know, um, and he's a Greens candidate, actually. Yeah. yeah hashtag um, not all Antifa. Yeah. <laughs> what about their human rights? to uh to yeah. bash and hospitalize people right? but it's typical of the left they'll that they'll, they'll always defend their their own i mean in victoria right, uh, daniel andrews would never denounce the campaign against racism and fascism but uh you know uh cory bernardi uh Love shelton uh chris kenny uh andrew bolt uh, can't fall over themselves fast enough to condemn fraser anning i've been spending a bit of time 
researching these these groups and how they're connected to one another. And um, I was planning a big sort of expose, and then and then Christchurch happened, and it kind of kind of made the research all um, kind of kind of useless, really, in terms of you know putting it out there like, hey guys, there's these groups that are connected to anti I don't. I remembered the the point that I was going to make. Now you mentioned that um, they'll never these these left wing politicians they won't condemn Antifa. Now um, we got a screenshot. Lucas shared it in one of the articles of Kathleen on her main account or on one of her accounts saying they were organising a campaign for the extradition to Australia of uh, a man called Jock Palfreyman. Jock Palfreyman. Now, you can Google him and it comes up with your Wikipedia page. He is a convicted murderer um, in imprisoned in Romania, I believe, um, who is a, a, an Australian um, who stabbed a guy and killed him. Um, and their, their campaign, you can read about the details on the Wikipedia page, but essentially they're saying, oh, we can use Larissa Waters' office to print off, you know, materials. We can, we can use Jonathan Ceri's office um and and i confronted them about it and they go yeah they can do that oh if we knew it was a murder we probably wouldn't do it you know oh if if we knew somebody that we knew was assaulting somebody we, we probably wouldn't print materials for them and they begrudge they begrudge the right to have peaceful involvement in in politics you know you saw that with thomas brasher and uh, the rest of those those blokes who were driven from the national party you know they, they're not allowed to have a platform or any kind of political participation. And, you know, what do you think is going to come from that? You're going to cause more disenfranchisement, um, more desperation. When If people think that they can't vote their way out of a problem, um, then there's it's going to lead to other issues. And that's all I'll say on that. It's not a like a incitement or a threat or I don't know. But, you know, there could be people who are, who are still growing up who who just go, well, look, it seems like the world's against us. They don't want us to be represented in, in politics. They don't want us to, to... They begrudge us federal funding for our campaigns. Meanwhile, they're using their federal funding to campaign for murderers. Um, yeah. Oh, well, we hope that in your case, uh, justice does uh, prevail. It's it's great to uh, hear that you're, you're doing well now and it's been... Good to have you uh, back on the show, and we'll do it more often. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. And that's the show for today. It is pleasing that The Unshackled is rapidly expanding to new heights. Thank you to all those who regularly turn to us now for their news and commentary. We aim to continue to provide you with an alternative to the mainstream media and cover stories that they would prefer to ignore. We are consistently growing across all social media platforms, Facebook and YouTube, as well as free speech social media, as part of our plan to diversify our online presence and beat potential censorship. Gab is where we are most active at gab.ai slash the unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash the underscore the unshackled. We have a MeWe page at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And we also have a growing telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled, which a lot of people are migrating to. To continue to produce the output that we do, we need the financial support of you, our followers. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled you also have our premium membership option on our website which is the unshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership thank you to all those who've signed up recently and contributed as well it all goes a long way we are going to air on a tuesday night so stay tuned for minecraft with james fox higgins on the rational rise youtube channel at 8 p.m australian eastern standard time thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.